Welcome back to the Let's Talk Business podcast. I'm your host, James Price. And today we're in the world of family business and quite a substantial family business. The business is located at its headquarters quarters, are near Warhope, Coffs Harbour, well, Warhope and, and, and Port Macquarie, really, um, on the mid north coast of New South Wales. The business name is Expressway Spares. And my guest today is James Dunn. James is the Managing Director of Expressway Spares. James, welcome to Let's Talk Business. It's great to have you on board. Thanks, James. Yeah, Thanks, love you. I mean, it's, it's really good to, you know, I'm excited about, uh, about talking about Expressway Spares and, and the journey. Um, I guess I should explain, you know, my understanding is probably a three generation family business, yeah, starting in what, 1960? 1964, James. 1964, so yeah. It was started by my grandfather. Um, that's correct. He, um, he and my uh, grandmother and uncle and, and mum uh, immigrated from France in 1951. Yes. And I ended up in a working in a sawmill, or he ended up working in a sawmill west of Port Macquarie um, at a small place called Yarris, and he was involved in the timber in the timber game for for a number of years, and yeah. ended up hogging trucks and so on. Um, but saw a, a gap in the market um, in relation to wrecking machinery, wrecking large machinery, and basically sold his log trucks and started Expressway Spares in 1964. That's, a, that's amazing. And, and, and I guess, you, you know, did, did your family come out from France as a result of sort of the aftermath, I guess, of the Second World War and the hardships that that caused? Absolutely. He was too young to have served in the Second World War. Um, so he was in his mid-teens, um, at, well, in his teenage years through the war, um, Yep. And then um, post-war, uh, met my grandmother and, and um, you know, started a family and, and just saw that Europe was struggling. So they actually um, applied to immigrate um, uh, from memory to Canada and Argentina and Australia and the Australian response was the, the quickest and um, so they came out in, in, in 51 um, and literally had a few dollars or a few um, pounds in those days to his name, and you know, started looking for work. He ended up in a in a chook farm in Quakers Hill. Oh yes, yeah. and that was that wasn't for him. Um, went to Coffs, uh, looking at banana farming, and thought that was too hard of work. And, and then ended up in a garage in Port Macquarie, um, working for a gentleman. And you know, he, he, his board was the uh, a fair bit of his wage, and well. Wow. Uh, Stumbled across this um, basically a sawmill, one of those uh, sawmills where they had lived in accommodation. So the job came with a, a small timber slab hut, and um, that's where they ended up, uh, I think, in 1952. And they were there for 12 years basically, and um, no running water, no electricity. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty tough, uh, and, and you know, conditions that others were used to in, in Australia at the time, but for them, you know, coming from, from my grandmother was from Paris and my grandfather from Orléans, just south of Paris. And, yeah. um, but he was a hard worker and just saw a gap in the market, basically, James. So he could never understand why um, it would cost so much to get parts for either trucks or bulldozers in the, in the logging game. And basically saw the, the 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 wrecking and you know the um the 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 gap in in the market generally and uh, a machine towards the end of its useful life was worth more in in parts than it was as a whole and yeah. um so they started wrecking machines um where we are in in 64 um and you saw the from your visit recently, you know, a bit of the evolution of the place, so it's just sort of evolved from there. It's, am it's amazing. I mean, you know, we talk a lot um, as as business owners, and you know, uh, across all work walks of life, about resilience today. But you know, 
I mean, your story just then's given me a whole another perspective on resilience. If you think about the forebears um, of your your family as a as an example, I mean, the hardship they would have faced leaving loved ones and their lives in Europe to come to a place they'd never sort of known about before, and then to sort of find their way with you know little means but hard work. But still, ha you know, still have the entrepreneurialism to say, but hey, there's a gap in the market. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. Sure. Yeah. And, and look, he, he, he was lucky when he was uh, working the sawmill, he was lucky enough to see a, an old AEC truck, a, a 4x4 truck. And um, so he, he uh, went to the branch, local branch bank manager, um, which happened to be in Kempsey at the time and, and asked to borrow the money to buy this truck and do it up and start on his own, you know. And um, the mill owner at the time had basically said to him, look, um, you know, if you if you are successful to, you know, purchase this truck, I'll take as many logs as you can to bring me. So he, he went to the bank manager with my grandmother and, and um, uncles then and, and mum in tow and basically said, look, I'd like to borrow... Um, 500 pounds, half of it to buy the truck and the other half to do it up and get going and so on. And the, the bank manager, so the legend goes anyway, the bank manager said, you know, where's your collateral? And he said, well, they're out there and I need to feed them. So they're waiting <laughs> in the corridor. And so he, he started off with the one truck, but because it was a four-wheel drive truck, um, James, he, he was able to um, haul logs in inclement conditions, you know, wet weather or dirt yeah. roads and so on. And so he just hauled logs seven days a week, rain, hail, or shine. And um, basically his competition, when it was raining, they'd, you know, in two-wheel drive trucks, would basically end up in the pub or, you know, doing something else. And um, he was still he going. Up, he was still going. So he ended up then with half a dozen log trucks and drivers working for him and he hauled logs, you know, Day in, day out. He he said he, you know, when he first got going with the log truck, he basically worked every day for about four years straight, except for Christmas Day. <laughs> That's amazing. And that AEC, did we see a replica of that when when Patrick um, Belinda uh, took took us around uh, the site visit? Yeah, you did. Unfortunately, the original was was that far gone that it, it, it disappeared. You know, rusted into the earth basically. But. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we did that that up, had that done up for the 50-year uh, anniversary of the business, um, obviously um, nine years uh, nine years ago. So we we'll, we'll be 60 years in business next year. And that's exciting. Like 60 years is uh, you know six decades of uh, family and generations building a business. I mean, you know, it seems the first step was that gap in the market, basically. Bringing, bringing spare parts to the coal face being being the forests where where they needed them for the machinery um, uh, perhaps James step forward 60 years where where's the business today give us a feel for for what expressway spares looks like in all its glory today yeah so I just you know I'll, we'll, we'll do a quick fast forward um, it, it, it started through the wrecking of machinery and and that was all brands. Caterpillar, um, Diamond Sea Trucks, Elias Chalmers and, and other brands. And over time, you know, there was Komatsu and Terex and, and other stuff, international trucks and so on. Yeah. And um, the, the, I suppose the, the feeling and the finding was that the cap gear, um, just through the nature of the sophisticated inventory system that, that Caterpillar had, and they mark every part and so on, it was just easier to deal with when you pulled the machine apart. Yeah. Um, so eventually, they quit, the business quit all other brands and just focused on, on Caterpillar yeah. and used Caterpillar gear. Um, and we we used to deal predominantly in used gear, but then evolved and, and um, worked through the reconditioning process of parts and components when it needed reconditioning. My grandfather would have sold everything used in, in his day because, you know, it was just, you know, move it on and, and, and make a quick dollar and so on. But more and more customers would ask for a reconditioning of their component. And cat gear and a lot of the larger mining gear um, is designed to be reconditioned and, and, and um, reused a number of times or within its 
design life or or tolerances. So today um, we recondition basically parts and and components for heavy earth moving equipment, predominantly Caterpillar, but also Hitachi. So we're in the large mining game now. So um, triple seven truck size up to 793 trucks, D10 to 11 dozers, uh, large excavators in Hitachi, 120 tonne up to 500 tonne excavators, um, large graders. So we, we've evolved because the mining um, industry uses their gear uh, 24 seven and, and treats it quite harshly. Um, and there's a lot more value in some of the larger stuff. Now to competing with um, the, the cat dealers um, and um, you know uh, other other dealers, Hitachi dealer and, and, and so on. Um, in mining gear in Australia, in the Pacific, PNG and Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. And we also export to the US, um, sometimes into Europe and South America and so on, but you know, we export all over the world now. So we, um, you know, you, you've got some of the the footage, I'm sure, of the the, the place. And um, so it's it's been a, a slow evolution, but an evolution that we've now hit a real sweet spot in in what's a you know quite a complex and and and, and burning market. James, we were talking about cat and 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 you know servicing those parts for your business to be good at your business do you have to be a good sort of identifier and sourcer of parts worldwide is that one of the capabilities um, because you know on our trip around the other day god there's a lot of parts on site all shapes and sizes right and yeah my sense is parts are funny things like sometimes they're needed regularly and then other times it's spur of the moment, right? But but they they're needed to keep a machine operating. Sure, and we're we're in the grey market, I suppose, James. So we're outside the cat dealership network. However, um, we operate uh, in the life cycle of some of these machines where they're much older, and um, all equipment manufacturers will support whatever they're, they're, they're producing in the early stages of their life, um, and that falls away over time. So um, some of the gear, we've got historic you know, parts and, and stuff in inventory that is quite old, uh, and from time to time someone will call up and want something that's, you know, 20 plus years old. Um, and so there's a bit of, bit of that. Um, there's also uh, customers, you know, a bit like um, any aftermarket supplier or service shop there's you know uh choice for customers in different industries so you can go to an auto tune and then get your mercedes tuned or you can go to the mercedes dealer so we're we're in the you know the gray market or outside the dealership network um and the dealers and cat at one point saw us quite negatively negatively yes, um, the, yes. You know, just competition and just cannibalizing you know some of their market share however I think they've come to the the view. Well, I'd like to hope they have that we we're product support, um, and you know we we support them, and 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 we 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 are advocates for the cat brand, and and you know people like choice, and um, having people like us gives them choice. Other brands of heavy earth moving equipment, uh, it's quite difficult to get parts and components once it falls outside that dealership range. So. They might be cheap up front. Um, however, uh, you know, longer term, it's quite difficult to source replacement parts. And so there's, you know, we're, we're part of the offer in, in, in the game. But um, look, we're buying and selling stuff all over the world all the time, um, mostly in Australia, obviously, because of yeah. logistics and so on. But, um, yeah, look, there's, there are cat dealers that we know and, and they know us, you know, all over the world. I mean, what struck me as I looked around your facility and the extensiveness of some of the, the workshop facilities that you have is the sort of value proposition that, you know, if I'm, if I'm a you know, civil earth moving business or I'm out in a mining services business, I'm really, you know, my money is made when I'm, I've got the machine on site and the machine's working. 
And, and looking around your business, I mean, clearly you have a number of clients that rely on you for those component and part switch outs where you're reconditioning, uh, but you're sending them, um, you know, a replacement version so they can keep operating. That's that's obviously a, quite a big part of your business as well, right? It is. So it's it's called in an exchange process, and 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 there's it's the same uh, sort of process in the aviation industry and other industries where yeah. you need to replace an engine, for example. Um, you you have you you forecast when you need to replace the engine. A reconditioned engine is sitting there waiting. The machine stops. You change the engine out. They send us the used one for reconditioning, and off they go and use that use that that machine. Um, you know, as as it's as it's you know needed. Um, and and so I, I know the aviation industry changes out engines like that, and they 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 buy and sell those engines on on an exchange basis. So I'm yeah. sure it's a number of industries, but the heavy. Earth moving industry, um, you know, really does that um, quite quite well, and 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 um, the gear is designed to be reconditioned. So, CAT say that a reconditioned engine saves up to eighty five percent of the embedded carbon of a brand new engine. So, wow. which, which, which is amazing, really. Yeah. So we're we're in the recycling business, um, James. As well, yeah. No, that's fascinating. You know, from forestry to recycling. Um, That's it. Um, and 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 look, you know, we've we talked about one area that you've got a lot of capital invested, and that's in 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 steel, iron, and parts. But I imagine another area, in, in looking around your facility as well, is in is in human capital, in in people expertise. Can you give us a, a sense of the breadth of your, your your team and and those capabilities that you've got to have for a business like yours? So we've got some staff that have been with us a long time, uh, one staff member, uh, almost 50 years, um, wow. others into the 40s and, and 30 years and so on. So our average tenure, uh, we've got 320 staff now, and our average tenure is um, about seven years, and we've got 70 staff that have been with us for over a decade. Um, and, and I suppose we, we've tried to create a... Uh, and this has evolved over time, but uh, uh, quite a family-friendly environment and culture, so that people stick with us for a long time. Um, but you know, we 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 have had to be um, reasonably independent in learning processes and so on. And like you say, our human capital is without without our staff, we haven't got a business. No. Uh, without our customers, we don't have a business. Um, but you know, we've got a bit of a you know, a, a, a niche offer, um, and it's just evolved over a long period, James. So um, we are trying to capture as best we can that experience and pass that on, and, and that's, you know, there's a lot of succession process that we're doing with junior staff um, and, and different uh, key, key positions, I suppose. It's really about those key positions um that, that's important and we're, we're you know we're looking after those key positions quite well i think if i'm a if i'm a young dude uh wish i was um you know and i'm going into a trade related um field you know mechanical field fitter and turner machinist the likes um what's it like working for a family business the one the, the, you know the likes of yours what's different about that you know, versus the other options I might have. Yeah, so we're we we're, we're probably um, I, I suppose senior staff are more accessible. We're relatively small too compared to some larger organisations. So we're quite we quite try to make ourselves quite accessible. Yeah. Um, and you know, we 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 have uh, family and and staff events uh, relatively often. Two two formal ones that the company pays for and then we have social clubs at each of our branches um we we try to get to know our staff um as best we can given time constraints running you know running the business so um i think that personal relationship is is there and you know we 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 compete in the marketplace in terms of pay rates and, and all that sort of thing uh in large organ organizations and that's generally whether it's family or or, or um you know 
or, or listed on the stock market, um, you can become a number. And it's quite a cold process in terms of the the sacking or your know, hiring of, of staff. You're you're a, a real resource and a commodity for us. You're a, you're a person and a, a part of our our machine that we'd like to keep you know moving and forward and growing. So we we try to foster um, our staff and, and grow them. You know, within a, a a career that they can have within our business, albeit relatively small um, business, and albeit that we want to also grow <laughs> grow that that business. So, um, I suppose just the the ability, uh, and you know, my uh, uncle was managing director for the last thirty years, and handed over to me on the first of July. But you know, he generally know. Uh, each staff member by first name basis and would say good day to them walking the floor or whatever that might be. So, you know, and, and staff feel um, quite um, positive about that because when the boss walks past and says, you know, Bob, you're doing a great job, you know, keep a, keep up the good work and, and how's Sue and, and so on, it means a lot to them. That it's not just about the productivity and the money that's, you know, being produced out of their hard work. It's it's more than that for us. And um, I suppose also with, you know, in a family business, we can take a lot long, much longer term view and we can support staff through difficult times, whereas in corporate uh, companies, you know, it might be that they've got a, Cut and shut a little bit quicker when when there's a bit of a downturn. So, yeah. um, you know, we it's I, I suppose James, we're small enough to be flexible and and to ride th- things out and take a long term view and invest in our staff. Um, and and look, it, it, it's hard sometimes when you know there's big dollars on offer in mine sites or fly and fly out, you know, in the Pilbara and the yeah, like. Exactly. It's hard to hold on to people, you know. So we, we we employ a lot of apprentices and a lot of larger um, businesses will only accept tradesmen. So um, some young fellas will come to us, get their apprenticeship, get great experience, and take off for a, a high powered job somewhere else. And and you know we 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 prefer to hold on to them, but we also understand that for some people that's what they'd like to do. You've talked about a career, and and I think you've you've hit on some key things there in terms of family businesses being, you know, treating their team as if they are a member of the family in, in, in a sense, but also having that perhaps longer term view about, about the world and, and providing stability um, yeah. around that. And I guess, you know, your retention rates <laughs> are a case in point there in terms of, uh, you know, showing that, that obviously, you know, your team values that. Um, but what about, for a family member in the business. You, you just spoke about the transition there. Um, yeah. 30 years, Patrick was in the role as, as MD. Um, you've taken the reins as MD now. You're, you're, you're a significant leader in the business. Um, was that a planned process or did it develop over time? I mean, what was it like for you? I mean, and what's your career been like in that sense? How have you felt, how have you felt that unfold in a family business? and? I guess, what are the learnings for other family businesses that you might point to as yeah. part of that? So when I finished school, uh, I didn't know what, what to do and um, had a long chat with my grandfather who, you know, engineering came up and at the time there were, you know, the family and we still have some land holding. So, we, you know, it's a bit of a side business for the, the core business, but we're doing some industrial subdivision. And so I ended up doing civil engineering, uh, a degree in civil engineering and worked in construction and dad was a builder and built a lot of the sheds here. And so it was getting experience outside of the family business. And, and you know, in some ways there's an old adage of learn, learn and, and make mistakes on someone else's account and then, you know, come back to us when you're useful. So I did a <laughs> bit of that. That that was, uh, that ended up being a 20 year process. Uh, and I came back to the business in 2007 um, and have been quite heavily involved um, since then. And um, I suppose um, in relation to um, dealing with family issues and a family business, it's much easier when people are in the business working away um, and understand the business and the business 
issues in terms of having a, a, a common direction when others are not working in the business but have other needs or desires, look, I want a dividend or whatever, it may can create conflict when you know those in the business might have a much longer term view about things and are looking to reinvest and, and so on and so forth. So it's about, I suppose, aligning the family plan inside and outside the business. And there's no need for people to be, you know, uh, swinging spanners in 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 this in this business. My, my two brothers are outside the business, one's in Melbourne and one's up north and they're in um, uh, technology and construction, so different areas, happy to see things going well and so on and very supportive of the, the trajectory. Um, my cousin, uh, Stefan, Patrick's son, is a sales rep. He works here and mum that you met works here as well. So I suppose making sure it's aligned, that there's a plan for everyone that, you know, okay, everything's being invested or everything's being pulled out, whatever that is, and that those in the business and outside are, have the same same goal, I suppose, for it. Um, in terms of succession planning, um, uh, you know, my grandfather was managing director for 29 years until he passed away and Patrick's basically 30 years. So um, we've got very... Um, um, I suppose long term stable stable seniorities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, lots of nepotism thrown in as well, obviously. <laughs> but um you know, I, I've and I've got a, a son who one day may or may not want to come into the business, but I think we we we're, we're trying to set it up so that it's run professionally. Um we have independent board members to who to advise us as well. Um so we're trying to mirror a, a corporate structure with the family element. So, you know, keep it professional, um, keep it neat and tidy, um, but also, you know, keep it flexible enough that, okay, you know, we we, we can um, do things like decide to throw Friday Friday afternoon drinks for whatever reason, you know, and, and not have to worry too much about things. So... Um, it, it is a challenge, James. You've got to really, you've got to work inside and outside uh, on the business, on your relationships. Um, and, and, and you know, family businesses are fascinating in, in a lot of ways because of that. Um, you know, they're all different, like all families. Yeah, no, James, I mean, I, I really respect you because it's not an easy process, but, but, but you know, I've seen some very valuable family businesses as a result of the ethic and culture that's worked at and developed. Um, in leading, uh, and I don't want to presume that you're the only person that's been leading it, but in leading part of that succession process for your time in the business, yeah. I mean, what have you got to have? Uh, have you got to have a degree of patience, but, but have you also got to be you know, very transparent with, you know, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of talking and canvassing to get people on board. Is that, is that, uh, is that some of the aspects? Yeah, I suppose uh, I look at, you know, mum's family um, didn't, it wasn't, hasn't been a smooth ride since my grandparents passed away. So there's six siblings um, and four of them uh, are no longer in, involved in, in, in the business. So, um, you know, it's we've had a lot of trials and tribulations along the way. So, but we've we've now settled quite well, and it's been amazing. You know, when when you you go through some periods where there there are diverging views of things, and and others um, at some at one point all just want a dividend out of the place, happy to see it sit and just chuck the thing dry, and that wasn't the view of the long-term view of my mum and my uncle, Patrick. And um, so, look, we've, we're able to get to a point where, okay, we're now uh, very much aligned about the long-term view of the, the business. Yeah. And, you know, it, you've just got to go through sometimes these trials and tribulations. And, and we've settled, now that, now that all that's been settled, it's solid as rock um, for us. And it might appear like that's been that case for a long time, but no, there's been some ups and downs. Um, and, you know, I think um, you've got to just um, be, um, 
you know, in what for us, it's taking a long term view, really. Yeah, 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 and and getting people aligned. I, you know, I I, I can see that's important, and and and. If you think about you as a leader in the business today with others, but, but in terms of your journey, uh, what did you get from the outside experience away from the business that you use today um, versus what have you sort of grown up with in the family that you use today, do you think? Are there particular qualities? Yeah. Yeah, it's like gr- gr- growing up observing my parents and my and my grandparents the the work ethic that they had to go through and those you know the the um i suppose um legendary times of when they had nothing up at yaris at the sawmill and you know evolving from that uh and then being quite successful but then trying to hold things together we the business went through some tough times in the late 80s early 90s with a lot of debt and high interest rates Um, being outside of the business um, I suppose different management styles. So I worked in a, a number of different construction-based businesses, um, and construction be, can be quite confrontational. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was fortunate enough to work in work in Ireland in, in construction, and then I did an MBA in in Paris, and sort of got a bit of a world view of different different aspects. But here um, we are trying to apply. I'll, I'll say sophisticated management techniques to something that's pretty much, you know, um, you know, uh, blue collar mechanical processes and so on. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, 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 you don't have to apply some of those, um, I suppose, high end corporate management speak stuff. Um, to the nth degree, but being able to be sophisticated and and, and just uh, engage with customers at, on a sophisticated level is important. Um, you know, we, 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 we're we're a, a funny animal, James, having it involved over so so many years. So we've got you know we do some things quite well, and other things we could improve you know hell of a lot too. So, James, I mean, I, it's something we talked about previously, but. And it's not a negative comment, um, but you know, having vid- visited the site and better understood expressway spares as it is today, and knowing the construction and the mining sectors, um, you know, there's a lot of complexities, there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and you're a major service provider in certain places to those sectors. So there's a lot of complexities in your business. I mean, we always say as business valuers that the businesses that take the com- complex problems and deliver simple solutions to the customer are the ones that create true value because, you know, yeah. oftentimes the customer's like, oh, how do I deal with this problem? It's too complex, too hard. I just want to keep my machine going. Um, but I imagine there's a lot of complexity in your business that you've got to solve in order to deliver the value proposition that you deliver on a daily basis. Uh, absolutely, and the, and things, you know, evolve over time, James. So we've got we've got some great relationships with customers where they might have surplus parts and gear. They they know there's value there. They don't know how much the value is. Um, they don't know how to capture value and so on, and we've we've built up a, a solid enough relationship where we just say, look, you just send it that to us. We'll assess all that. What's of no no use goes in the bin, and we'll pay you fair value for for what's left. That's a bit of a a trust and a relationship thing, yeah. um, but for them it's brilliant because otherwise they'd be thinking, you know, it, this stuff. Some of it's soiled, some of it's damaged, some of it's brand new. How do, how can I get value out of this stuff? And yeah. Out, we've got guys constantly sorting parts and bits and pieces and and and, and working through things. Where a customer, it, it's it's honestly, it's it's like at the rubbish end of the scale of things for them to deal with. But they capture some value um, when it comes to all the reconditioned parts and components. The skills, knowing what they want at a particular time or in a breakdown period. So you know, we're constantly 
um, working on our stock and our inventory to be able to supply customers with something that they need at any point in time. And you see uh, swings and roundabouts a little bit. We might reduce a certain um, cylinder group for a, for a certain model, uh, and that model of machine might go out of favour, and we're stuck with stock on the shelf. Yeah. Um, that which is which is you know a bit of a skill in where the supply and demand is, and we've got. Now we've got five branches around the country. We're able to relocate stock uh, to suit different local dynamics, um, and that's that's a bit of a, a headache for us. You know, making sure you've got the inventory in the right spot. Um, we don't have um, the ability to have widgets on every shelf for every model. You know, at all the time we're, we're we're too small for that. So we do move our stock around and um, try and respond to the customer demand at a local level. I think, you know, you touched on sophistication before in terms of management processes and engagement. And I think, you know, in the last discussion, you've, you've kind of hinted at a number of areas of sophistication, you know, where you're, you know, looking at customer needs and how to manage those carefully. Um, you talked about your, your, your locations. Um, I, I know you, you, you've, you've got a very sort of new location up and coming. Um, uh, over in the West, can you can you talk to us about that? And in the context of how far you look ahead in terms of your your growth plans and your development plans? Yeah, so we we uh, uh, a customer of ours around ten years ago wanted, or a customer and, um, and and competitor in some ways wanted to quit their used parts in Perth, and they offered the the whole package to us. So we, we bought all the stock and took over the lease, um, which is where we are now. And that was 10 years ago. So we, we, we um, basically jumped into their used parts business, which was a kickstart of business in, in Perth and, and yeah. WA. Um, and it's, you know, there are different commodity types over there. And as you know, James, the iron ore and, and gold and nickel and lithium and, and so on. Um, not much coal. Uh, there's a little bit of coal down there service in the local power yeah. market but um, it's an opportunity for us to do, diversify away from east coast federal coal in new south wales and coking coal in, in queensland um, so we're there 10 years now and we just um with the you know basically through uh the uh pending expiry of our lease we decided to look around came across a a developer who's you know now making us a purpose-built facility and and will be uh, multiples in terms of size um, uh, a facility over there in WA and you know the aim is to basically try and balance rebalance our exposure to different to commodity types and um, you know longer term thermal coal um, while some say it's got a, a future for many decades to come others would like to turn it off so we, we're trying to risk minimised by um, not having complete exposure to thermal coal, basically. So you have an exposure to iron ore and hard rock gold mines and lithium and other other things as well as well as your traditional coal coal clients. Yeah. Yes, and, and the goods, you know, we, we, we re at the moment we're reconditioning uh, goods here near Port Macquarie and, you know, trucking them across the country and exchanging them. So we, we, we're spending a lot on transport. And the idea is that we you know, establish a facility over there and reduce our transport costs and also provide a, a better offer for our customers. They can expect the, the goods as it's been reconditioned or the, or, or the like. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big step for us. And, um, but, you know, in terms of the time frame, <clears throat> we could be in this facility for at least 25 years under under the arrangements we have with the, the lease. So we're looking forward to being there for a very long time. And, um, you know, that's the coming back to the long term view. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to take a, 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 a punt on a market like that with a plan to be there for a very long time. And hopefully we have a, a, a very fruitful relationship with our upcoming landlord. Look, I, I mean, that's fascinating and, and, you know, the diversification that you're undertaking, which will, you know, help underpin, underpin the value of the business, I'm sure, because it'll, as you say, give that sort of, you know, counterbalance and risk mitigation. But 
I, I have to say I'm, I'm very envious of, of your longer term view because, you know, in business today, I think the world is such that we become very transactionally focused. And by definition, that seems to move people's minds to just looking in front of them. So, you know, it must be, it must be challenging to sort of manage the day to day, but, but force yourself to say, well, hold on. Yeah, there's a few bumps in the road, but I can see that out there, it's looking like this, this and this. And, you know, not all, I don't think, James, I'm not saying you take it for granted, but I don't think, I don't think all businesses have that view. Um, and it's, you know, you've spoken to us today about, about the strength of your family over those generations and what your grandfather did and, and, um, and, and your uncle and, and now yourself. Um, I mean, I can see how that longer term view has come about because it's been passed down, it's been lived in, yeah? yeah. Uh, look, that's, none of that's without risk though, James. You know, there may be, you know, extreme changes to certain commodities by way of political intervention and, you know, so, um, you know, for argument's sake, China could stop buying our iron ore uh, on a political basis. Uh, that would, that's difficult for them in the marketplace, as I understand it, but, you know, there, there could be extreme changes for one reason or another. And so it's not without risk, but I suppose um, we, we are now settled as a family unit in terms of the long-term uh, intent for the company. Um, you know, people have knocked on the door and said, are you sellers? And, you know, I suppose one would say, no, you never say never, but, um, you know, the intent is to hold and run the company into the long term by the family, you know, for all our stakeholders, whether it's family, staff, customers and so on. And we have an offer, I feel, that will be quite enduring, um, even if the industry does change. Um, you know, we are operating on some piece of equipment that are 20 years old and um, there is uncertainty in where things are going equipment-wise with electrification and batteries and hydrogen and all sorts of debates and so on. And, and, and we will have to evolve with that at some point in time. But at the moment, um, we see things being quite busy for a considerable period. And, and you know, um, we're taking a punt, really, James, on, on the fact that that's going to be the, the case. And, and um, you know, everyone's excited by the punt. Um, we are uh, uh, at the same time as growing, trying to you know, pay down debt and, and, and you know, Put put away the, the the shackles for a rainy day, um, but you know we are taking a long term view for sure. James, look, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us today on the Let's Talk Business podcast. I mean, yes, you may be taking a punt, but um, I mean, I think history is on your side in terms of the track record of you and the generations before you. And the impression that I've got is, notwithstanding the depth of that history um, and, and hard work um, and knowledge and know-how, you're not just relying in the, on that because I, you know, I hear in your voice and discussion a lot of innovation around how the business has been taken forward. So thank you so much, James, for joining us today. We really appreciate um, having yeah. you on board. And I hope your view, viewers uh, got something from it, James, and that they uh, didn't feel they, they wasted the, your podcast. <laughs> so that was James Dunn, Managing Director of Expressway Spares. A business, a family business, that's almost six decades old. And wow, didn't he take us on a journey um, of his forebears and how they started the business, the ingenuity, the hard work, and the, the plans and inspiration and long-term view into the future as to how that family business is growing and developing.